thank you very much um, for the invitation and your kind introduction. Uh, so today, uh, today I'm going to be focusing on uh, some of the principles that we've kind of gathered from our work over the last several years, dealing with atypical and atypical development uh, of brain networks and how they're formed. I just want to acknowledge the, uh, my group, um, considering of uh, many different uh, levels of expertise in different domains. Uh, these individuals in particular for the work that I'm presenting here today. So uh, we want to understand how uh, the brain functions. Uh, it's important to kind of uh, understand how it comes to be through uh, development and the learning process. How uh, the initial structure, um, the core structure of the brain is then used to build and scaffold networks for learning uh, and formation of complex uh, cognitive functions. And the general idea is that there are a lot of things in terms of both learning as well as things that go awry in psych uh, various uh, psychopathologies, including autism. Uh, they are uh, now considered to be uh, uh, aberrations in the formation of particular circuits that form the uh, core uh, functions that, are, that go awry in many of these disorders. So we've known for a number of years now this kind of pattern of uh, gray matter maturation uh, with uh, uh, increasing levels of cortical uh, pruning leading to thinning and which is kind of assessed in this gray matter uh, thickness measures. And the idea is that the nodes of these systems are continuously undergoing change and that should have some implication for how these, uh, how the brain uh, systems are functionally organized. And so the general ideas uh, on which uh, some of these, uh, this work is based is actually quite simple. That is that if you look at the uh, uh, changing uh, pattern of uh, contributions of a given cortical or subcortical node to function, uh, there are two general underlying principles that govern uh, how they come to represent information and how they come to process information the way they do. And this has to do with two essential notions of uh, the uh, structural integrity and the intrinsic connections of a node and the fingerprint of connections of uh, these areas. And one could argue that most of the burden really is on the con uh, connectional fingerprint because there is a general uh, canonical cortical uh, representation of these nodes in terms of excitation and inhibition. So what really should drive a lot of the changes in development are really uh, changes in uh, connections. And now, of course, one can study this in the general context of connectomics and you know, graph theoretic uh, metrics, but they leave unclear the links with learning and disorders and, and cognitive function. Uh, so the challenge is to relate uh, changes in uh, the connectome with changes in cognitive function. And now this, of course, has import for um, the study of uh, psychopathology a number of developmental psychopathologies, including autism, where uh, there's evidence that there, is, uh, there are cell migration deficits or imbalance in excitation inhibition in particular nodes. And if they happen to be in core hubs of the brain, like the posterior cingulate cortex, they can drive a lot of uh, cognitive and affective dysfunction across a wide range of target uh, connected regions. So some of the things we've learned from kind of doing, uh, you know, individual node-based analysis as well as whole brain analysis of these circuits uh, ha that have evolved uh, are something I've actually summarized here in this TICS article. And, uh, uh, and so in general, the structural backbone of this system is actually quite well developed uh, by age two. And the functional connectivity patterns of some of these uh, core systems like the default mode network or the frontal parietal system, they exist by age two. Uh, what changes, of course, is the um, interconnections between different systems. And this kind of circ uh, functional circuit maturation goes on well into adulthood. And one of the key features that characterizes uh, the development of the system is the formation of segregated and specialized functional un uh, circ units as well as their dedicated circuits. And I'll show you some examples of these. Uh, 
And this is led by fine tuning of uh, local circuits uh, because in, um, as you might surmise from the changes in gray matter uh, uh, maturation and pruning, some of these uh, circuits get structurally fine tuned and underlying that of course is changes in excitation inhibition balance which gives rise to uh, more uh, fine grain structural nodes uh, which then has uh, implications for how uh, proximal areas talk to the rest of the brain. And I'll show you an example of that from our work on the uh, proximal amygdala nuclei, BMA and LMA. So uh, then the other kind of notion that's evolved from this work is there's a systems level pruning uh, of connections brain-wide. And one of the dominant things that drives this is differences between subcortical and subcortical, uh, cortical and subcortical connections uh, with uh, an overgrowth of uh, subcortical uh, to cortical connections uh, in children, which then gets pruned uh, over development to cortical cortical uh, connections. And then kind of more recent work uh, showing that uh, functional networks, which are intrinsically dynamic, they, are, they become more uh, dynamic and flexible uh, with development. And I'll show you an example of that. So this is just going to very briefly taking you through some of the uh, results which have led to these, uh, to our enunciating these uh, uh, general principles. Um, so this work um, from Gao et al. showing that by the age of uh, two, the global efficiency starts to look uh, like that of adults and modularity and a few other network measures. Uh, if you look at global small world kind of architecture, by the age of seven to nine, that's really indistinguishable from adults. But there are features, and of course, uh, a lot of things are changing despite these gross uh, you know, brain-wide metric similarity across uh, between children and adults. Uh, and some of the measures of uh, hierarchy of networks, uh, as well as um, changes in local uh, connectivity versus long-range connectivity undergo change with uh, the uh, short-range connections being stronger in, in children and the longer-range connections being stronger in adults. So there's a complex profile of changes that occur that build on a core backbone that's already well formed by the age of two. So this is kind of showing you an example of um, the uh, differentiation and fu uh, functional circuits that occurs. Uh, it's just an example to show you here with the BLA and the CMA nuclei of the amygdala. Um, in early childhood, there's a strong crosstalk between these nodes, which gives rise to overlapping uh, connections uh, as you look brain-wide through multiple functional systems, and it gets uh, increasingly segregated uh, these are the patterns associated with the two nuclei. And the connections strengthen overall and they get more differentiated and segregated. And this is an example uh, showing uh, the complex pattern that evolves and we've replicated this in two samples. And what really drives that is this general notion I mentioned of uh, uh, stronger uh, local connections. So the uh, uh, BMA and the CMA are tightly linked in early childhood, which gives rise to undifferentiated circuits. And that's the uh, pattern that I just showed you. With development, what happens is that these nodes get locally uncoupled, which then shows up as very distinct connectivity patterns. And that's, we think that's driven by um, changes in GABAergic signaling, uh, which gives rise to a more fine-tuned nodes, which has a uh, major influence on brain-wide connectivity. So this is just an illustration of some of those principles, and I think they're quite easily, uh, uh, they can be easily put into models and, uh, and tested out in a very computationally rigorous manner, some of which we've started to do. So this is kind of illustrating um, the uh, point that I mentioned about the changing landscape of cortical, uh, subcortical connections. The, uh, the, there are overrepresented in children, uh, the, the degree uh, is higher, the path length is shorter in children compared to adults, uh, 
And this is really very different from a lot of other systems. And if you look at the mean connectivity differences, you see this kind of dissociation with the subcortical uh, cortical links being stronger in children and the cortical cortical links being stronger in adults. And you can use these patterns and actually to differentiate between children and adults. And the subsystems that show up the biggest difference are the ones that link uh, subcortical to cortical structures, which has a lot of implications for how these areas process uh, information related to habit formation and reward processing and so on. Some of whose effects we see uh, much later on during adolescence in terms of proclivity for reward processing versus uh, relative weakness in development of uh, cognitive control systems. So these are factors, developmental factors, in terms of whole brain organization that we think contributes to that. So the other kind of final point that I wanted to make uh, was this kind of the other approach to looking at whole brain organization uh, in uh, the context of uh, uh, isolating individual components, and we know that there can be, you know, the brain-wide, for example, task or resting state activity can be segregated into these functional systems, and um, and there are there's a lot of model building and theory building that can go around it. And one of the systems that we've really, f uh, the three systems that we've really focused on is a particular process uh, that we think involves the core uh, components of the salience network, the anterior insula in particular which uh, serves as a, a gating mechanism for salient uh, sensory and limbic stimuli, which then um, downregulate the default mode network and upregulate the frontal parietal uh, working memory system in order to engage in appropriate uh, uh, context-dependent uh, information processing. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the default mode network can um, put a memory or timestamp on it as uh, it absorbs that information and link it to the hippocampal uh, memory system. So this is a general formulation of an attentional system that engages and provides access to resources for salient uh, events in one's environment. And so there's a whole model and theory we've built around this, uh, and these systems pop up over and over again in virtually every um, psychiatric and many uh, neurological disorders, particularly the frontotemporal dementias. So we've used this as a model for trying to understand um, how these um, cross-network interactions develop in, uh, uh, in children. And we focused on these three uh, core networks that I mentioned to you earlier with the visual system serving as a control region. And here's, here's uh, uh, an assessment of uh, developmental differences, both kind of within uh, network nodes like this one here and cross-network nodes. And we see that uh, both uh, within network and cross network interactions are strengthened uh, in adulthood. So these uh, networks are relatively more segregated uh, in children, and there's a more dynamic crosstalk uh, as, as the brain matures. And this is the other kind of principle that I wanted to illustrate to you. And underlying that is changes in uh, white matter pathways that link these areas. And we can tie the, uh, the degree of change in the structural links to the functional. So there's a structural underpinning to this. Uh, and, uh, and this has uh, import for, so some of the things I showed you are with, so far have been trying to understand the principles based on organizational of the intrinsic connectivity patterns. Of course, this has import in terms of information processing as well. And so in this study, we had uh, adults and kids do a arithmetic problem solving task and you see that the causal interactions, uh, this is assessed using two different approach, uh, approaches, uh, a multi-variate uh, um, uh, dynamical systems approach, uh, as, well as, as well as a multivariate range of causal approach. And you can see that uh, the cross uh, uh, network links in terms of relating and providing access to the parietal working memory system are actually uh, strengthened in adult. Um, in adults compared to children. So the features, some of the features we see in intrinsically are always uh, have to be thought about in terms of how they um, facilitate aspects of information processing. And, and so I think there's a back and forth between trying to understand the intrinsic architecture and how it contributes to um, more efficient cognition. <coughs> 
And this is again showing, you know, this is related to the model of the frontal insular cortex as a, a node that picks up salient stimulus in the environment and uh, engages other systems. And it's just showing that the same pattern is observed in both children and adults. The strength of that link actually uh, is uh, predictive of performance with a number of uh, links contributing somewhat uh, more weakly in children to accuracy um, and reaction time uh, than much more uh, limited set of links and stronger predictions on the adult side. So the way these networks get configured and the strength of their uh, st uh, strength of their causal influences during task processing have a bearing on how um, proficiency in task performance uh, increases. Uh, and so uh, the idea then um, is that these networks provide constraints on how we can model and think about information processing. Now, the other thing that we've kind of uh, done more recently is to use, uh, we know that these, uh, even these so-called statically identified networks, um, they have constant interaction as I showed you with the uh, with the changing patterns of intrinsic connectivity with age, as well as uh, the causal influences during uh, information processing. Uh, and we know that these systems do interact, and uh, we've used hidden Markov uh, models now to try and understand the nature of these states uh, and uh, to model them, uh, to identify dynamic functional circuits and how sticky and how flexible they are over development. And this uh, just slide just briefly summarizes the difference between adults and children. You can see very, uh, so these are individuals over time. You can see the states in different colors. They change much more rapidly. And in, in uh, children, you see these sticky states that are relatively inflexible that last for uh, much longer times than what you can see here in adults. And you can actually quantify this with uh, mean lifetime of states. And you see that uh, once a child is in a particular state, it's tends to stick in that state. And so the, uh, the mean lifetimes are much larger and the transitions between states is actually weaker uh, in um, children. And so we want to apply this to our cognitive tasks as well. But the general idea it illustrates is that uh, children tend not to switch between states uh, and, uh, and this may lead to behavioral in inflexibility that we've now tried to understand, uh, particularly in the context of uh, autism research. So uh, this is just basically a summary of uh, the findings related to the principles I've tried to illustrate. So just very briefly before I go into the next part of the talk, which is more focused on the atypical development, focusing on children with autism, is that the functional backbone is established by age two. Uh, so some of these core systems are in place. They're strongly driven by um, the uh, early developmental processes. And, but on top of that, you get a lot of complex uh, features of pruning and segregation and formation of individuated circuits, which have an, a strong bearing on, on how uh, cognitive and affective information is processed, because now you have segregated uh, channels, which can interact only at a few places, as opposed to more globally, because the nodes that process different types of information are segregated. And then you have this notion that the cross-network links also become uh, much more dynamic uh, and uh, strengthen uh, with uh, development. Uh, and uh, this kind of finding related to our uh, model of the salience network is something that switches across states that is also borne out in terms of its being weak and therefore um, it has uh, consequences in terms of how different systems are engaged during active information processing. And so that's kind of the general uh, set of ideas related to the principles uh, that I uh, told you about earlier. So now I want to kind of move um, to tell you a little bit about the, um, the work uh, on um, autism that we've been conducting. and. We've been primarily focused on trying to understand not just the global architecture, but how do we go back and um, link uh, these notions uh, that we are, both in terms of principles of adult brain organization, but the developmental trajectory as well, to understand the core triad of deficits, social uh, language communication, restricted repetitive behaviors. Uh, 
And now it's increasingly clear through a large body of work that um, uh, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder of brain circuits. Um, the question is when in time it occurs. And we have access to information from seven-year-olds and I think the challenge is going to be to go younger to figure out uh, how they came to be. And so the general questions here are how does the brain of a child with autism differ? How do we relate it to clinical symptoms? How does it change with age? Can we identify biomarkers? Can we model the brain and with some of these principles that I enunciated earlier to see how they are or not, are not borne out in terms of actual human neuroimaging data? And just to illustrate that the, um, the notion of autism and brain connectivity has now, is now so tightly linked that um, it's hard to conceive of models that don't involve connectivity in some sort or the other. And that makes sense because uh, you have miswiring of local circuits resulting from EI imbalance, which as I showed you an example of, even in normal development, you can get cross, um, uh, cross nodal uh, connections and you can as well imagine with uh, dysfunctional nodes and the kind of the general idea there's um, a high level of uh, comorbidity uh, uh, in terms of epilepsy in, in autism. All of that has kind of given rise to the thought that there are EI imbalances that drive um, dysfunctional connectivity. Uh, and so the question is what are the characteristics of that and uh, how do we think about uh, their relationship to clinical symptoms in some principle uh, functionally uh, meaningful manner. So, uh, so one notion is that you have core um, nodes or even rich clubs such as those that link these various modules uh, and if you have dysfunction in one of these you could have wide ranging a uh, set of cognitive and uh, affective deficits. Uh, as opposed to, you know, a node in some peripheral uh, node that might just uh, influence or affect only a, a module of uh, um, a constrained um, set of nodes. And so kind of just going back to this uh, general idea of the, of the cortical fingerprint, if you have a dysfunctional node, uh, perhaps one that's sitting in a core hub of the brain, it's going to have a major influence on cognitive, social, and affective function, uh, whereas a node that's sitting in the periphery may not have such a large impact. So um, I think you're familiar with some of these systems, particularly the default mode network, which is anchored in the posterior medial cortex, which is going to summarize, this slide actually summarize, uh, summarizes a wide body of our work that we've been uh, conducting and publishing relating these systems. So um, we've related the um, social abilities, uh, deficits, uh, disabilities to the default mode network, language communication deficits to the extended voice selective system anchored in the posterior temporal sulcus, and uh, the attention and restricted interest uh, clinical feature to the salience network anchored in the insula. Um, so just kind of to take you, so the, the next set of slides basically takes you through uh, publications that show you how those were borne out, providing some evidence, but that essentially was the gist of our findings. Uh, and so um, if you do a, uh, a, a standard analysis of gray matter volume in, um, in autism, there's all kinds of confounds of age as factors and the results over the years has been uh, highly variable. But one of the things we then did was to say, well, maybe it's not a volumetric change, at least in a wide age range. Uh, rather, it's the structural organization uh, of gray uh, and the adjoining white matter. And what we find is uh, strong evidence for posterior cingulate cortex uh, dysfunction. And there are actually cytohistological studies showing cell migration deficits in the posterior cingulate cortex uh, rather than even the fusiform gyrus scenario uh, that's implicated in uh, face processing that people initially thought was dysfunctional in autism. And so the question then is, you know, there is a node, going back to this node and its fingerprint, uh, there is a dysfunctional node here. Can we tie that into um, uh, social uh, deficits in, in autism? And there is a large body of work, which uh, I don't have the time to get into, uh, which um, 
uh, involves a range of co uh, social cognition tasks, uh, initially performed all in adults with theory of mind, um, the self in the context of the other, and, and um, a whole uh, range of them pointing to um, involvement of the uh, default mode network, in particular when you're making judgments about yourself in the posterior cingulate cortex as well as the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. The functional roles are somewhat dissociated, but this is the node that has been identified in structural studies now, and in particular, the strongest evidence that I have seen for histological um, uh, cell migration type of deficits is really the posterior cingulate cortex. So we kind of then, the other piece of the evidence, of course, here is that you have the work from Hagman and many others now with the structural connectome showing that the posterior cingulate cortex and the posterior medial uh, cortex in general ha are like a structural core in terms of they have the shortest path length to the rest of the brain. So it's a good candidate node to look at in terms of all of these pieces of evidence that have accumulated. And so the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that when we talk about uh, regions like the posterior medial cortex, and this is an issue with the ongoing connectomics work, is the lack of focus on the anatomy. And this just result just shows you that the cortical connection fingerprints uh, are really very different in, um, in these adjoining areas. And so, and that's kind of mapped out here with the posterior cingulate being very strongly linked to the, uh, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and precuneus to kind of uh, the uh, motor system and the, uh, and the parietal uh, SPL visual motor uh, regions. And so you really, and then the retrosplenial cortex to the medial temporal lobe. Uh, and this finding in children actually roughly replicates uh, uh, what uh, the dissociations that have been seen in adults. So even by the age of eight to 10, these kinds of uh, segregations already occurred, uh, although we haven't really directly compared the children and adults here in this study. Uh, but these dissociations have to be paid attention to because the functions of these regions are very, very different. And so I'm arguing against a pure putting all these nodes into a connectome um, saying you need to focus on the functional neuroanatomy of these regions to understand uh, this both function and dysfunction. And here's just the data showing the, the uh, again, another aspect of heterogeneity and dissociation in the sense that the pattern of, uh, of differences that you see are actually very different, not just qualitatively, but uh, not just quantitatively, but qualitatively, because you see a pattern of uh, hyperconnectivity in children with autism uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the posterior cingulate cortex and the retrospinium cortex where it's completely flipped over in the, uh, in the precuneus. So the functional anatomy matters and the functions do matter as we think about this and it turns out that it's the connections of the posterior cingulate cortex that's actually predictive of the social um, subscale measure of social abilities in children with autism. And this again, it's hints at a out of network cross wiring as a, uh, uh, as a metric uh, related to dysfunction. So again, some um, set of links have gone awry and these are good candidates at this point and we're trying to understand them with functional imaging tasks, what exactly um, is going on there. So the second piece, do I have? So the second piece is really related to the other core um, symptom, language impairments, uh, and they present, and they're not in the nature of uh, individual uh, word reading uh, and so on. Uh, they, these uh, children tend to be, at, at least at the high functioning and hyperlexic. Uh, it's really at the uh, level of uh, expression and communication using language. And, um, and even paying attention to salient um, sounds in the environment. And so while they can hear normally, the audition is fine, the way they attend to stimuli, and um, as here's the canonical example of this, where the child uh, with autism does not respond um, to his mother's voice, uh, much to uh, chagrin. Uh, and so this has been kind of, uh, well, kind of documented anecdotally. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the social cue, how, how is it, processed and how is it uh, related to um, either normal or abnormal pr uh, 
um, circuits in related to the posterior temporal surface, um, which is the voice selective cortex, differentially responsive to the human voice uh, versus matched, uh, acoustically matched uh, environmental sounds, for example. And that's been a body of work for the last 10 years, and we're still, we're trying to piece the circuit part of this now and trying to develop our analysis framework based on this. So what really struck us here in this study was that the uh, posterior, oops, uh, the posterior temporal sulcus node shown here actually is weak, much weakly connected to not the language areas, but the reward processing system, sorry, uh, shown here with the responses, weaker responses in the accumbens, uh, uh, the anterior insula, the orbitofrontal cortex, and, um, and this is just kind of a more extended version of that. And in fact, you can actually trace this down to the ventral tegmental area. So we think there is a miswiring of the voice circuit with the reward pathways, and, the, and this may underlie uh, a lack of uh, response to saliency in the vocal uh, stimulus and lack of attention to them because it's not something that the child uh, feels uh, uh, is sufficiently rewarding to orient to compared to or something else in the environment, like a vacuum cleaner or something like that. Okay, so uh, then we can actually ask, you know, is the, is the connectional fingerprint related to uh, uh, social and language communication deficits? And it turns out it's specifically related to uh, communication scores in these individuals. And you, the pattern you see really are some of these areas involved in uh, reward and affect. So, the, so it kind of expands the scope of some of the ways we think about language communication, not in terms of language, core language circuits, but really in terms of whether the child actually attends to the core vocal features that most of us actually find engaging and rewarding, to so the affective part and then the intrinsically rewarding part is the novel aspect we've shown here. And how do we build a model? How do we take this set of findings to create a model and then design appropriate tasks to look at these systems. And the general uh, model that we've now come up with is you just need to focus not only on the voice selective system, uh, but on this extended system which involves um, reward related processing. And so uh, we've designed an experiment uh, where we ask the child to listen to the mother's voice and control voices and environmental sounds. And it's just some pr uh, preliminary data that we published earlier this year just looking at controls while our final sample of children with autism is being acquired. And we see that uh, uh, the response um, to the mother's voice is actually exaggerated, not just in the voice selective cortex, but also in these same target areas that I showed you earlier with the orbitofrontal cortex, the anterior insula, and the nucleus accumbens. Uh, so we've taken this idea of a dysfunctional circuit and tried to map that into um, a process uh, that we think is dysfunctional in children with autism, and this provides a new framework for thinking about uh, uh, deficits in communication cues. And this is just showing that even in children with, uh, I without autism typically developing, you can actually take um, measures from this system, uh, the connectional fingerprint. You can go back to the same areas that are identified in the intrinsic system, and you can actually predict individual differences in social communication uh, uh, abilities. And so now we're trying to extend this now with the autism sample to kind of see uh, how well uh, this model plays out in terms of actual processing of these types of stimuli, and it provides lead in into uh, some aspects of uh, therapy as well, which revolve around pivoting a child towards a engaging stimulus by rewarding that response. And so we're kind of back here uh, to this kind of system, the network model that I showed you. And I want to end with uh, an example that relates to the third um, core symptom of, of autism, which is the restricted and repetitive behaviors, not particularly talking about the motoric behaviors as much as the restricted interest, the narrow focus on one topic. And the, the idea that, um, that um, evolves from this work is that Again, if you look at across all the brain networks, the ones which are most dysfunctional, it turns out to be the salience network uh, that um, you can use to classify children um, 
with autism from typically developing, and it's a hyper-connected system. And so the general idea is that, um, so this is just showing the classification rates, showing the salience network is highest, and we can actually take measures from this and show that um, you can predict, depending uh, on the, these measures of hyper-connectivity of the system, that it's uh, related to these uh, restricted behaviors and interest score. And the general theoretical idea is that this is a system that cannot engage, disengage itself from what it's doing. And so there are uh, large classes of stimuli in the environment to which the child does not then orient attention to. And this um, is a model for thinking about restricted interests and, and attention to it that's very narrowly focused. Uh, and this just shows that we've now extended this with, again, uh, uh, cognitive tasks involving a, uh, a P300 type oddball paradigm to looking at um, socially relevant faces versus scenes. And here again, if you look at the difference between how much can you, a child modulate the response between the intrinsic state and the task state, um, that actually predicts restricted behaviors. The, the inability to modulate intrinsic systems is actually predictive of uh, the restricted interest. So again, kind of a model here that we've been working with uh, that there are, there's a weak mapping of the external world and saliency that then prevents engagement of these other systems and uh, disengagement of the default mode network in particular that allows uh, the child to focus on those narrow interests as opposed to attending to the environment in a dynamic way. So just the last slide here, I want to conclude with some of these things I've said. So the first part dealt with some of the principles that we've gathered based on individual studies of formation of segregated circuits, pruning of global connectivity, strengthening uh, of cortical-cortical, weakening of, uh, of uh, subcortical uh, cortical connections, uh, and then tie that to individual tasks and, uh, and then to individual features of uh, atypical development. And, and these circuit models provide a way uh, to think about these things in a principal way. Uh, but um, I think the intrinsic connectome is just the starting point. You need to probe it with appropriate stimuli to get a sense for how uh, manipulable those circuits are in relation to either hyper or hypo connectivity that you see in atypical uh, populations such as autism. Thank you. Thanks.